Hi everyone, my name is Nick Vujicic and I'm so grateful that you've decided to join me this month for our Never Change talk show, Champions for the Brokenhearted. I'm excited, humbled, moved to announce that we will be releasing bonus content from this episode from members of Circle of Champions. During the bonus section, we will be asking our guests additional potent questions that's really going to even open up further the layers of topics and discussions in the area of their expertise. For that, please visit lifewithoutlimbs.org slash circle to find out about Circle of Champions and how you can get access to this exclusive content. I want to tell you right now a topic out of all the topics that the Life Without Limbs team have chosen out of the 106 different topics that we have of the first 12, suicide was something that we needed to discuss right here. A topic, as you know, if you know anything about my life story, it's close to my heart. I attempted suicide at age 10. I've lost friends from suicide. Today, with suicide rates at an all-time high, not just in America, but worldwide, it is more important now than ever to sound the alarm and break the silence. Out of all the people we could ever have imagined to have here today, we are so moved to have Jacob Coyne, a special guest who's sitting right here, who has dedicated his entire life to basically say, here on until my last breath, my life's mission is to break the stigma surrounding mental health and to end the suicide epidemic of this generation with a movement that you may have heard of called Stay Here. Jacob, it is such an honor to have you here. Give me a fist bump. Thank you. It's um, an honor to be here. Love you. Thank you for flying in. Love you too. Um, say hello to your wife and your three kids for us. <laughs> I love you guys. Love yeah, you, yeah, you can say hi to them too, but <laughs> say hello back to them when you get I home. Will. Brother... You are such an ambassador. He's an ambassador for Gen Z. Thank you. Um, Jacob, God has called you to start a movement to end suicide. Yes. Period. Yes. Tell me how did God stir up your heart and bring you to a position of influence to now starting to see the beginnings mm -hmm of teenagers saying, you know what? I got it. I will never think about suicide again. Let's talk about the beginnings of this movement. Right. So it all started for me when I lost my uncle Greg Sweet in 2015 to suicide. He was like a father figure to me and he helped me come to Jesus. Um, so he had Parkinson's disease and he lost the battle to that disease. And he was a, just an incredible man, an incredible so man of God. And when he left our, our family in 2015, that left a huge mark on my life. And then I was a youth pastor. And as a youth pastor, I lost two students to suicide. In fact, wow. one of them um, jumped, over, jumped off an overpass and I drove by her um, while the paramedics were taking her off the, the street. Um, so that obviously left a massive mark on my life. And, then in 2019, I had a mentor named Jared Wilson, and Jared Wilson was a pastor. And on Suicide Prevention Day in 2019, Jared decided to take his own life and leave his wife and kids behind here. And when that happened, it was a wild story. This is what really impacted me. I had recurring dreams about Jared while he was alive, mm. that I was walking with him on a shore of a beach, but there was water all around his mm. face, and he was looking at me like everything was okay, but it wasn't. And in the dream, I asked him, Jared, are you drowning? Because there's water all around you. And I'd wake up from the dream, but I never had the courage in real life to reach out to Jared because I always thought, like many people think, 
that if you ask somebody, are you thinking about taking your life or are you hurting, are you depressed? You're just gonna push them over the edge and you might plant the idea in, in their head. Mm. But when Jared took his life, I decided I can't just cry about this anymore. Mm. I can't just lose friends and family members and students to suicide. I need to do, I need to get educated. I need to learn about suicide. I need to learn about anxiety and depression and self-harm and why people decide to do this. And when I discovered that actually asking the question, are you okay? Are you thinking about taking your life? Are you struggling? That actually saves lives. Mm. It doesn't take lives. Mm. And when I discovered that, I just knew that we have to start an organization that speaks against this. We need to break the stigma. We need to break this taboo thing, even in Christianity, where it's so scary to talk about suicide. So we started Stay Here in 2020, and I had spoken at a couple of schools. We started getting booked to speak in schools, but then the pandemic happened and shut everything down. And then in 2021, so this is just, we've just been doing this for a couple of years. In 2021, I was in Kona, Hawaii with some friends in ministry at YWAM and I started to get prayer. My wife was getting prayer. And I had a vision where a man named Lou Angle, he's a big prayer guy. He was on a stage on his knees screaming, Gen Z will be suicide free. And in the stadium, all teenagers were there and they were shouting back to him, Gen Z will be suicide free. And they left the stadium and they kept shouting it in their, their, their high school campuses, their college campuses, even in middle schools. And we started to see the end of this epidemic that we're seeing today called suicide. So really since 2021, we've been going hard after this vision and believing with faith that we can end suicide. But it's not just gonna be one man with a microphone doing it. It takes a generation to save a generation. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're here for. We wow. Stay Here just equips people and teaches people to stop suicide when you see the warning signs. Listen, many people we are oblivious to stats. Yeah. You've got right now fentanyl, 300 teenagers mm -hmm. overdosing every single day. You have, though, this epidemic of suicide. Right. Um, ages, I think it's 15 to 24, where it's the second most cause of death yeah. suicide and i just heard last week that with a smaller bracket and a younger bracket even 10 to 14 mm -hmm. that it's the same thing there but i think it was between ages 14 and 17 the leading cause of death is what i just heard mm -hmm. is suicide in america yeah in America, in, in the land of the home, the, the, the home of the, the free and the brave. Okay, what is going on? Tell me, what, what do you think has happened? Yeah, I think ever since 2020, it's like we've been taught to just be afraid. Everyone is in constant fear and anxiety. And then also you have the, the social media craze. Young people on average are on their phones nine hours a day watching video content. Nine that, hours a day? Just video content. That's not talking about texting or anything like that or Googling things. Wow. Nine hours a day watching uh, Netflix, TikTok videos, Instagram videos, all sorts of bad stuff that you can look up on the internet, nine hours a day. So I think the problem is we have messed up our, our, chemical, our minds mm. chemically to need dopamine, to need a fix mm -hmm. all the time. And we've lost touch with reality. Mm. It's easy to make a 30 second TikTok video and if you don't like it, you can delete it. So people just think, I can just delete my life. I can just end my life. And we've, so many young people say, I don't even know what's real anymore. Everything feels fake. When they're in a physical place, like a school campus, mm. they can't figure out the difference between what's real and what's fake because our minds are so messed up with social media. And that's that's one of the big things for our organization. We want to be on social media where lost people are. We don't wanna avoid it. A lot of Christians would avoid it and say it's it's bad, it's evil, you shouldn't be there. But, but like what you're doing, I see you on TikTok and all these different apps preaching the gospel. We wanna be where people are. Mm. And that's what Jesus does. Mm. Jesus is with the lost mm. and we need to be with the lost, so. 
that's the biggest issue that, that I'm seeing. And we understand that the mental health, I mean, what you just said, what he just said was scientifically proven. There is rewiring that happens in your brain. Yep. Okay. That's why I actually think that actually more school shootings are happening. Yeah. You know, before we take, you know, take, I'm sorry, but we got to, we got to stop these kids watching shooting games, mm -hmm. you know, and, and interacting it, to me, it, it's, it's, it's more than just a, a mental health thing. And it's even more like, I know you're going to agree on is, is it's, it's not just the addictions and the rewiring, but it's also spiritual. Yeah. yeah the, the spiritual realm is real. Yep. I mean, I know who you are because we have same mutual friends and we respect them. Mm -hmm. And so for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ and who believe in heaven, we also know that just as Jesus is real, so is the devil yep. seeking who he can devour kill and destroy mm -hmm. our own children the spiritual realm of this talk to us about that dimension when we talk about the context yes of this uh pandemic epidemic whatever you want to say yeah well it says in john 10 10 that the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy but Jesus says, I have come that you may have life mm. and life to the full or mm. life more abundantly. Mm. So that's what the enemy does. He wants to kill us. Mm. He wants to steal everything from us. He wants to destroy us. And, you know, even as an organization, our team decided, you know what? We can't sugarcoat the truth. There, there's enough of that. We, we can't be fake about this. We can't hide Jesus behind this mental health message because at the core of this is the spirit of death. If people are ending their life, that is the spirit of death coming to take them away. So when we actually started to change our direction and preach the gospel within mental health awareness, mm. we started to see more people set free. When you speak the name of Jesus over these issues, it exposes the darkness and it has to leave. And I think for too long, we have been so shy about doing this because there's that stigma behind mental health. We want to be, we want to make people feel comfortable about it. But when we actually expose the darkness and call it out, it has to run. It has to flee. I think the biggest eye opener for me personally was when I was supposed to speak at a youth camp. And on the night that I was going to speak, I never got to speak because so many students were getting delivered and set free. So I was going to, to preach the gospel and even talk about and call out suicide and anxiety and depression and self-harm. But at this event, when I was closing out worship, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, like just calmly, I wasn't trying to make anything happen. And all of a sudden, so many students just dropped to the floor and they start crying, they start screaming. And a couple of the students, you can hear, I, I don't know what you guys think of, you know, this might be new for so many people, but there are demonic forces that attack people. And there are students who are saying, I am, this, I am the spirit of death, or I am suicide, I am self-harm. I am going to take this person out. Mm -hmm. And we would come at these students and we would bring them back and talk to them and counsel them through it and get them delivered from these things. But there are real demonic forces. There is darkness that's trying to take out this generation. Mm -hmm. And we will win this fight. Mm -hmm. The enemy will try to come at us like a roaring lion. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail. Mm -hmm. All we need to do is stand up and speak the truth where there is this darkness. We need to expose these issues with mental health. And you know, the church actually invented the hospital. Did, did you know that? I didn't know that. The church invented mental, it, it invented healthcare. But I think that we're so behind in mental health care. We don't talk about it enough. And I've seen so many pastors and youth pastors talk to me and they say, when I actually started talking about suicide, when I did an altar call for suicide, people got set free. Even my youth leaders began to get set free. Some of my worship leaders began to get set free because we're so afraid to talk about mm. it in church. Mm. So we need to talk about this more. How do you start people to, to start talking to you about their anxiety, their isolation, their depression? Um, I'm gonna ask you in a second. I just wanna mm -hmm. say this though, listen, I want you to know that I, I will tell you how powerful counseling is. I think what um, was just hit right on the, the nail, right on the head, is the, 
the disability of the church of many includes no Christian professional counseling. Yep. No one's talking about abortion, PTSD. Mm -hmm. No one's talking about sexual abuse. One out of three girls are raped in America, sexually abused mm -hmm. up until age 17. One out of five boys abused in America up to age 17. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's not just what, what Jacob was saying was true, that there are some demonic forces assigned to you. But even when you come to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's in you, in no other spirit, for as long as you walk in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you put your armor on and you grow in the word of God yourself, you're not dependent on your church to keep their doors open to study the Bible or pray to God. You pray to God in your own room. You read the Bible. When you're walking and you're talking with God, as your personal friend, as your master, as your king, as your everything, um, the, the enemy cannot touch you. Yeah. But when you don't go to a counselor to talk to somebody about what happened to you last week, last year, 20 years ago, that wound, if not dealt with and healed, which I will tell you right now, Praying any prayer or fasting any amount of days sometimes won't heal wounds. Mm -hmm. It's not just a prayer for depression to be gone. It's not just a prayer for suicidal thoughts to be gone. We start there, but it's really you talking with someone that can say, tell me what happened. How did you feel? And I went through that process in 2021. Mm. I kept things in me. Wow. That, that with 2020, it's not just 2020. I want you to hear what Jacob's saying. It's not just like, oh, 2020, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. No, it actually unearthed yes. triggers of the past. Yep. Things that were not dealt with. Sure, there's change in yes, but really deep down, what really triggers us deep down in mental health are the unaddressed issues, the betrayal of people in your life. Mm -hmm. I, I went through six hours of counseling in 2021, six hours to just tell a counselor how I was feeling betrayed by six people. And it took me 10 years to forgive someone. <laughs> and I'm the evangelist. You know what I mean? Like, we love, right? It's not that we love licking wounds, but the devil loves us to go back and lick our wounds instead of being going through a graduation process, mm -hmm. a maturity process, uh, where we get promoted in our maturity in Christ to start seeing wounds as battle scars. Yep. And until you start seeing wounds as battle scars, we stay there in that depression. Mm -hmm. We stay there in that isolation. And that's what we want you to know holistically. It starts with you understanding that you need to talk to somebody. And the, the quarantine measures just brought a magnitude of volume yeah. to all this stuff because we were supposed to be isolated. You're not seeing your friends anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing your grandma because she's going to die. No, your grandma actually might be the closest person you're at because you can tell your grandma stuff that you can't tell anybody mm -hmm. and she'll never judge you. Some of you miss that friendship with your grandma. Some of you have no friends. And Jacob and I are telling you, church, listen, we need to be the church, the friend to the world That's to it. reach out and say, depression is real. Even if you're a Christian, depression is real. Yep. Anxiety is real. Jacob, how does a church set the tone? You're a youth Let's say you're a youth pastor mm -hmm. and I'm the senior pastor. Mm -hmm. And you say to me, Nick, we need to start talking about isolation, depression, suicidal thoughts. There's going to be a lot of church staff members here watching this too. 
how do we, and members of a church, who we can go to the senior pastor and say, hey, I watched this thing with Jacob and Nick. Mm -hmm. Here is the one, two, three for any church to say, you know what? You're right. How do we as a church start talking about this for real, like this Friday night? How do we start talking about it? Yeah. I think first things first is you've got to get trained. You've got to get educated in this. Kind of like, like I did. I was afraid to talk to people about this until I understood it. So that's one of our biggest resources that we have on our website. It's a free training. It's called the ACT Suicide Prevention Training. Amazing. And it teaches you the statistics that we've been talking about. It teaches you how to find the risk factors and the warning signs in somebody who may be dealing with trauma or depression or suicidal thoughts. And once you find those, it'll teach you how to reach out to that person, ask the right questions in a safe place mm -hmm. and get them freedom. So that is that training alone has helped so many lives get saved and set free. And then we have a free sermon series. So if you're a pastor out there, a youth pastor, and you have no idea how to talk about this, Amazing. we have a sermon series and small group materials to help you. So Fist we talk bump. about Come isolation. On, dude. We talk about anxiety, depression, and then suicide. So it's all there for you guys. Love it. Yeah. Free. Everything's free. Free. Free 99. Let's do it. Free 99. <laughs> I mean, you know what? Like, I know so many Christian schools that I've been to. I don't know how many schools you've done. Mm -hmm. We stopped counting because I don't have any fingers to keep up with it. But I think we've done over 990. I think we stopped wow. counting at 990 schools in 75 countries. That's amazing. It is amazing. Plus live streaming. Mm -hmm. So we're just about to do... Uh, a live streaming uh, of anti-bullying messaging in mm. a Christian school to at least 150 Christian schools at lifewithoutlimbs.org wow. slash stand strong. We're doing this annually mm -hmm. for Christian schools to hear me talk about bullying in Christian schools. I mean, come mm. on, youth pastors, you, you, the, the people that are going to your church Teenagers, they're having sex, they're saying the F word, they're addicted to pornography, you're just not talking about it. Mm -hmm. Christian schools, we need to end bullying. If, if, if a Christian school can't end bullying, hello. And so out of the 990 schools that I've been to face-to-face, -to -face, Jacob, mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know, what, what we do is I have them bow their heads, close their eyes, Put their hand up in the air and the hand is open. Now with this, I say, put your hand in a fist so no one's watching, including staff for liability purposes. Put your hand in a fist if you've thought of committing suicide. Mm. Pre-COVID, 6 to 12% mm. have thought of committing suicide. Wow. Hawaii, pre-COVID. 40%. Wow. Nevada, 40%. I'm saying an average of 6 to 12%. I've had the privilege of speaking to two state legislatures, Utah and Hawaii, about suicide. We've been on national programs with presidents about bullying in their country because we know the stats. 6 to 12% pre COVID in America had thought of committing suicide. Second question, put your hand in a fist if you've actually attempted suicide. Three to 6% wow. of American teenagers tell me right there and then, close their fist. Mm -hmm. Put your hand in a fist if you actually tried to commit suicide because of a brokenness at home. 40% Wow. for teenage suicide is because of brokenness at home. Could be fatherless, mm -hmm. could be divorced that they blame themselves for. Totally. Anything. 40% of the reason for that is brokenness. And the last question is put your hand in a fist if you've actually hated your life so much that you are convinced that there is no hope for you because of bullying at your school. Mm. 40%. So 40% of teenage suicide in America, based on the statistics of 290 schools in America, is because of bullying. 
that goes back to self-esteem, that goes back to what they're feeding their brain, to goes back to what you're allowing them to listen to, which goes back to you telling your, stu your students at school, your, your, your kids at home, that you're beautiful, 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 you're beautiful. Mm -hmm. You think you're lesbian? Okay, we love you, no matter what, we love you. You, you think you're this, you think you're that, we love you. Now, you don't need to now say, okay, now who really agrees with me and who doesn't judge me and who... Love is unconditional. No matter what, we're supposed to love everyone. We're supposed to love Muslims. We're supposed to actually love and forgive the person who rapes my daughter. We love everyone. But if you're of a religion and I'm your, not your religion, I'm not anti your religion. If you're something and I'm not, you know, I don't want now some religion that I don't believe in to now be indoctrinated in public schools. Hence, we can't say Jesus Christ. We also can't say Muhammad and the Quran. Same thing with any belief system that has anything to do with anything in diversity of the world. That actually is different. Beautiful world we live in. Diversification where we love everyone, but we're not going to indoctrinate everyone. We're not going to now say, hey, yeah. And just because my kids know who Jesus is, I know that if someone comes up to them and says, hey, I'm Islam. Hey, I think this, I think that. You know what we've taught our kids? We love everyone. And some of you, for self-esteem, there are so many of you, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, who see your friends saying something, doing something, experimenting with something, and because you're trying to get that chemical in your brain, mm -hmm. something new that's not mundane. I'm just saying don't let bullying, even passive bullying, media bullying, social media bullying, yeah. all of it, Hollywood bullying, change what you think you need to become. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to tell you well, you need to come to Jesus Christ or I'm not going to love you. Right. No. Nick, I'm this, that, 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 that. Well, guess what? We love you. Yeah. We love you. And we want you to know out there that at your school, if you're being bullied because you are lesbian and people are bullying you because you're lesbian or gay or transgender or queer, or bisexual plus, I am sorry. I am so sorry that someone's bullying you for your sexual diversity. I'm telling people out there, if you think that you have people bullying you because of your race, I am so sorry that someone's bullying you because of your race. Mm -hmm. If you're out there in a wheelchair and you have cerebral palsy or you have a learning disability or you're the poorest kid in the school and someone's teasing you because you have holes in your shoes. I am sorry if someone has ever bullied you because of your socio-demographic. I am so sorry if people have bullied you because you're so tall, because you're so short, because people think you're dumb. I'm so sorry if you think you're not popular and you need to be popular. You don't need to be popular. You're beautiful just the way that you are. I wasn't popular at school. I was teased because of my disability. And people say, oh, God's got a plan for you. God's got a plan for you. And you've heard that 
but you don't see it. And you say, God, why? Why was I born this way? Why do I have what I have? Why am I different? Whatever our differences are, I'll tell you right now, no matter who you are, God loves you. No matter where you live, no matter how your past looks like, God has a plan for you. You take your broken pieces, your broken pieces of the past do not define the plans and future that God has for you. Amen. I want you to know that I love you. We love you. You want to talk about something to us in the Bible? We'll talk to you about something. But we are talking about suicide right here. We don't want anyone ever again, right here, right now, to ever think of giving up. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. We love you. God loves you. Stay here. Mm -hmm. Please. Stay. We want you to know that if any Christian has taken advantage of you, we're so sorry. Mm -hmm. If any Christian was a reason as to why you haven't entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, again, I'm sorry, but it doesn't change who Jesus is. Yeah. You know what the stats are saying, Jacob? That within 10 years... Only 5% of Christians will be meeting weekly in a church if the statistics keep going the way it's going. Wow. So what do our churches do? Do we sing different songs? Do we make it more welcoming? Do we put more lights and everything like we did 15 years ago and watered it down and stopped talking about purity before marriage? what we did 15 years ago. So what does the church do? How do we get trained once we go through the training? Tell us a little bit more from the church's perspective. Mm -hmm. When you start going through the training, what else can we think through of just a simple checking in on that teenager? Mm -hmm. There's a teenager that I'm seeing in my church and I've gone through your training and I can identify their body language, Mm -hmm. if they're talking to somebody and kind of depicting, I wonder if they actually might be someone who's contemplating suicide. Right. Help us confirm that that's what our training with you helps us identify and even have a follow-up system and checking in on people within a church setting. Yeah. Can I tell you a real example of this? Please. That would be amazing. I think that's what we really, really need to hear. Yeah. So I have a friend named Robert who was going to end his life last year. He was the drummer at our church. And at the time, my wife was the worship pastor at the church. So Robert texted my wife and I in a group text on a Sunday morning after church. And he said, this is my last time drumming. I'm done. I don't want to be a part of the worship team anymore. And I thought that was weird. Like, why would you just quit out of nowhere? That's a warning sign right there. If you know somebody who loves something and they quit out of nowhere, they quit dancing, they quit the football team, they quit art, they quit singing, you should check in on them. That's strange. You should at least ask why they're doing that. So I I set up a meeting with them and he didn't show up to the meeting. I waited 30 minutes. No reply. Finally, he texted me back and he said, sorry, we got a rain check. I said, well, let's meet tomorrow then. He said, fine, I'll meet you tomorrow. So we have a meeting at the same spot scheduled, this coffee shop in Vancouver, Washington. And I was there and he didn't show up. He was late again, but he has an iPhone and and he's leaving me on red. I see all the read receipts. I keep texting him and texting him and I'm hearing nothing back. Then I get a text from my wife and Robert's wife texted my wife and said, Robert didn't come home from work today. I'm really worried about him. And then Mariah, my wife, texted me and said, this is not good. We need to find Robert right now. He's not at the meeting. He didn't come home from work. Let's find him. Because I know that Robert had already attempted suicide once in his life. Mm. And that's also a warning sign to watch Mm. out for. And that's what we teach in our training. Mm. 
So with all that stuff in one, I knew that something was up with Robert. So I went straight to it. I said, Robert, if you're thinking about ending your life today, if you're thinking about hurting yourself or running away or doing something you know you shouldn't do, please just call me first. I love you. I'm not mad at you. Your wife loves you. We can work this out together. Just please get back to me. Hear nothing all day. So my family's at dinner with another family. And then I get a text from Robert about 8.30 at night. And we, I lived in Port, the Portland area at the time and he pins his location and he's right there, right by the bridge between Washington State and Portland, Oregon. And he said, I'm so afraid. I don't wanna take my life tonight, but I'm so close to doing it. I said, Robert, can you please get back in your car, wherever you are, get back in your car and meet me at church if you're able to, unless I can drive right there. But I wanted Robert to get out of that headspace. I knew that the enemy was in his head saying, do it, do it, do it. And if he was able to, let's go to church. So he says, I'm getting in my car right now. I text him back, I'll be there in 20 minutes. By the time I get there, he's in the back parking lot. He's got blood on his arm. He'd already cut himself a few times. He had a razor blade in his hand and he's shaking. And he's a big dude. And I just said, Robert, just come here. And I just grabbed him and he still has the razor blade. And I grab it with my other hand and I pull him out of the car and it's youth going on, it's a Wednesday night. So we've got all these high school students all around. So I try to just cover Robert, we walk upstairs, and then I just say, Robert, why do you wanna take your life? Have you told anybody why? He said, no. And I just said, tell me, why do you wanna kill yourself? Because I, I feel like so many of us, we isolate ourselves, and mm. you were talking about it earlier. If we actually let the reasons out, mm. then God will fill us with reasons to stay. Mm. But you've got to tell someone the reasons why you're hurting. Repeat what you just said. That was profound. If you let the reasons why you want to end your life out, God will fill you with reasons to stay. It's, it's so hard to get healing from something that you're hiding. You've got to let it out to somebody at least to Jesus, but we're the body of Christ. Mm. We need to be there for mm. one another. That's why isolation is, is so crippling to people. So he tells me why, and it was a compelling story. But I said, Robert, that's not reason enough to, to end your life. Mm. I wanna help you. Mm. So we pray together and Robert gets a lot of freedom. He's, mm. he's crying and then it turns to laughter and he mm. says, I wanna live. Mm. I don't wanna die anymore. I wanna be a good husband. I wanna be a good father. Mm. I don't wanna do this. And I said, that's amazing but it doesn't end there. Mm. We need to get you home. Mm. You need to tell your wife the reasons why. Mm. Tell her this whole story. Mm. He said he'd never told her all this stuff. Mm. So he tells her why. And then I said, Robert, we gotta do a few things. So this is what we teach in our training. It's ask, convince, take action. Mm. So I asked him these questions. Robert, do you wanna take your life and why? But then I convinced him, Robert, the whole staff at church is gonna know that you attempted tonight. Are you okay with that? Because I need more eyes than mine on you. People need to know because people care about mm. you. He said, that's fine. Mm. I said, Robert. And they get to pray. Right. And fast. Yes. So we're fighting for his life together mm. as, a body of, as the body of Christ. Mm. And then I said, Robert, I want you to go to marriage counseling. Yep. I want you to go to personal counseling. I want you to see a doctor. Like, check your body out. What's going on? Is there something going on? Is it a chemical issue? 100%. Let's figure everything out. Yep. And then I want to meet with you and I want to know when you're going to counseling. Mm. I, want to, I want it on my calendar so I can follow up with you and make sure you're getting on this right track. So Robert says yes to all these things. He takes action and I take action with him. And as we follow up, I see him getting healed every single week, more and more layers of healing. And then he takes his wife on a trip to Puerto Rico for their anniversary. Their marriage is just thriving, it's restored. And then months later, Robert reaches out to me and he says, I wanna join the, the worship team again. And I want to film my testimony at the very spot that I was going to kill myself. So we went there Come and it was on, so, I just cried so hard. Dude. It was so surreal. We were standing on the ground where he wanted to end his life, where the enemy was whispering in his ear, kill yourself now. And he dances on that ground where he was going to take his life. It was just so beautiful. And to this day, Robert is free. So it takes community. It takes all of us to save a life. It's, it's not just like you said earlier, you know, we, we can pray things away but you've got to stay with people. You've got to stick around. You've got to be a faithful friend. The Bible says, love suffers long. Mm. You've got, if you love someone, you've got to be willing to suffer with them. You've got to carry burdens with them. You can't just say, I love you. I'm sorry for what you're going I'm through. I'm praying for you. Yeah, I'm praying for you. And you're lying. 
No, yeah. You're lying. I'm, I'm praying for you. No, right. you're not. <laughs> I'll headbutt you. <laughs> You've got to be there. You got to be. You've, You've got to be a real friend. And Jesus says, "The world will know us by our love." And you are saying all these, you know, Christians are leaving the church. It's because we need to love better. The world is looking for love. And Christians, the church, should be the greatest image of what true love is. And that's how we're going to save this generation. If we love well and if we stay with people. But we've got to be willing to do it. it there's a cost to it. It might inconvenience you. Like I was with my family. But, but people matter. I dropped my family off that night and I said, I've got to be with Robert. It might be four or five hours. But you've got to be, as, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, you've got to be willing to do that for mm. your brother or your mm. sister who's in need. Mm. You know, I have a pretty good read of people. But some of the people that I've known who committed suicide, I would never have imagined. Totally. Flip the coin on the other way. During 2019, 2020, and 2021, I was, 2020, 2021 especially, depressed mm -hmm. and, and anxious. And I, as a Serbian, Baltic, Eastern European, you know, if I'm not smiling, I've got a I'm going to kill you resting face on. You know what I mean? Like I'm like, I don't show much emotion that much, nor do I really open up to people about how we feel. Mm -hmm. That's not just culture. It's how you grew up that matters too. And how many people you have saying, how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. And I knew myself proactively feeling going into that depression. And the longer you stay there, the, 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 the longer you stay in the whirlwind of anxiety, I'm the guy that's supposed to be talking to the depressed and the anxious and the isolated and the people that are thinking of ending their life. Mm -hmm. And everyone thinks I'm strong. Oh, Nick? Anxious? Depressed? Do you ever think that Billy Graham was depressed? <laughs> Heck yeah! He had to have gone through depression. Uh -huh. We all go through depression. Right. And, and this, this simple steps that you just said is so amazing. Mm -hmm. Because during 2020 and 2021, I chose two people that I loved. Two people that I cared for. We knew that for two years, we were all heavy. Mm -hmm. And once a week, I would call one of them. Mm. You want to know why? Not because I think I could help them. Not because they think they could help me. Not that we think that we could have a conversation and everything's a little bit better. It's a subconscious way that we've actually been made by God to be connected yeah when you put two hands together and fingers into fingers dovetailing connecting mm -hmm. the greatest connection apart from jesus is your spouse go get good marriage counseling once a year before you think you need counseling it's right. called a tune-up yep you don't wait for your car to fall to pieces before you do a service to the car right you don't wait for a flat tire to go straight to the rim. You stop <laughs> and you fix it. The power of just connecting mm -hmm. and looking at people or calling and not just texting. Don't just text. How you doing? I could lie to you easy. Mm -hmm. How you doing? Great. How's the kids? Great. How's everything? Fine. How you been? Busy. Beautiful. Great. Nick's fine. No, he's not. <laughs> right. Call me. Yeah. My voice says a lot more than the facade of text. Bloop. Mm -hmm. You're bloop coming up. What? Bloop. What is that? <laughs> Forget that. Call people. Yep. 
Church, when was the last time you had cell group people, cell group people, call someone who's not in the cell group? Hmm. Whoa, what an epiphany. Church, very, very simple. Please, please go to stay here. I want you to know, church, you need to go to the website. What's the website? It's stayhere.live, L-I-V-E. Stayhere.live. Listen, how will someone know about the hope of Christ and the love of Christ and the reason to stay here unless someone tells them? Yep. How can you tell them if you're not trained in how to tell them and identify? And it's for free. Yep. This is the commissioning right here. We're not waiting for the denominations to become one. I give up on the denominations becoming one. It was never about the denominations becoming one. COVID 2020 didn't cause 42 denominations under the PCCNA to become one. They gather at one table, but they're not one. Right. So because Life Without Limbs believes that, it is champions in the circle of champions of the ambassadors who realize we're not waiting for a crippled church to become one. Yeah. And neither should you be waiting for your pastor to tell you what to do. Don't blame your pastor. Don't blame your denomination. Mm -hmm. Are we not the church? That's right. Go to stayhere.live -E to help people right now in your circle, you can be the champion in the circle of influence God's given you. Amen. And I'm going to challenge you right now to write down five names of people. Five names that you're actually going to call weekly. You're going to call two people on Saturday. You're going to call two people on Tuesday night. You're going to call two people and I don't care when. Do you know what that is? It's love. Mm -hmm. Love. And now to the people who you've thought of ending your life. You're sitting here, you're watching me get a little passionate. My arms are flying everywhere. But now I want to passionately speak to you. I want Jacob, Jacob Coyne, to speak to you. You're believing the lie that your life has no meaning. You have considered ending your life. You have thought. I'm too ugly. This is too much. I just want to check out a lie. Jacob, look right into that camera and tell this person who's watching why they should stay here. Hmm. I'm just reminded of a moment where I was personally so broken because of grief that I was going through and I wanted to quit even as a pastor, as a leader, it was in 2018. I wanted to give up on life. I had all this hurt inside of me, all this trauma. And I remember praying and I, I was trying to find some sort of peace. I had anxiety. I was depressed. I never thought I would do ministry again. And in that moment, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Jacob, my love is stronger than death. I know that the grip of death is so strong, but I'm telling you this. The love of Jesus Christ is stronger yet. There's no mistake you could make that Jesus won't forgive. There's no trauma that you've gone through that Jesus can't 
heal. And I even see right now, some of you think that the notes you're writing in your journal or on your iPhone, on your notes app, no one else sees. You've written out your suicide note and you think no one else has seen it. I'm telling you right now, Jesus Christ sees it. He's read every single word and he hears you. The Bible says that Jesus weeps with those who weep. He knows the pain that you're going through. He's not far from it. He's right there with you in your room as you're watching this. So I'm asking you to fall into the arms of Jesus because he can and he will set you free. I've seen him do it to hundreds of people now, thousands of people now, that when you call on his name, he will be there and he will deliver you. And then please, if you're dealing with this, don't just leave it in, in your prayer room. Don't just, don't just pray about it. I want you to talk to your mom about it. Talk to your dad about it, your grandma about it, your best friend, your spouse about it. If you're hiding this pain, it's time to let it out. So please right now, call on Jesus' name after you're done watching this and then call a friend and get the help that you need. Please stay. You matter so much. Listen, I want you to know that if you don't believe in Jesus, because it doesn't make any logical sense as to why a loving God allows you to go through pain mm. and you've prayed for things to stop and they don't stop. First of all, if you're in a dangerous place of abuse, domestic abuse, there's a national hotline yeah. right now to call. Call that number. That is not God's best for you to be put in a vulnerable place. That's right. Second of all, I want you to know that I've prayed for arms and legs and I have a pair of shoes in my closet in case he says yes to me. He healed my back. Medically unexplainably. I had holes in my spine. Mm -hmm. And I have none today. And the doctors call it a miracle. Yet he chose, he chose not to give me arms and legs to this point. What I want you to understand is when you don't get a miracle, you can still be one. That's right. And maybe you've gone through a brokenness at home. I tell teenagers all the time that I know that it has to be harder being in a broken home than having no arms or legs. And I want you to know today, you're here for a reason. Mm -hmm. Why stay? So let's say that all you've wanted was to have a mom and dad that loves you. For real. And you get through this. And you find healing. For the most important thing. First. Which is your soul, spirit and your mind. We can't turn back time. Mm -hmm. We can't wish things just to be better. But today, what if you actually choose to stay? Mm -hmm. You get healed in your heart and your mind and your broken heart becomes whole once again. Mm. And 10 years from now, you stumble across a 14 year old person who feels like giving up because all they wanted was a mom and dad that loved them. Mm. Can you not more powerfully in the hands of God help that person to know that God loves them and that there is still a plan for their life more than the worldwide limbless evangelist? Yeah, I might be meeting presidents, but your story is even more powerful 
for that lost soul. That's right. You know how many limbless people God's helped through our story? A lot. Do we know if God's going to give all the limbless people, including me, that I know limbs here? No. Are we waiting for limbs? No. You know what we're doing for those of us who are limbless? Go and encourage other limbless people to know that Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. And our greatest, greatest disability of all is sin and death, both conquered by Jesus Christ. And what do I look forward to in heaven? Not running. I'm going to see all my limbless friends with limbs. And they're going to say, I'm so thankful that you helped me believe in real love, mm. the love of God. You helped me to believe Jesus died for me. You helped me to believe that this place called heaven was real. What about that day for you? How many people do you think would make it all worthwhile from a logical point of view in how a loving God could allow us to go through something? It would be that we, when we give our brokenness to Him and find healing and truly be free indeed, that you then can say, yep, my history is His story. And then you, in turn, become part and the member of the circle of champions. We're in the circle of your friends. Five, ten, fifteen years from now. Not only can you say, yeah, I was broken and now I found healing. But you check in on them and you say, hey, how are you doing? There's a greater purpose for you. You're here for a reason. And God can do anything beautiful with our broken pieces if you give your broken pieces to Him yep. today. So, right now, if you don't know of the Jesus that we're talking about, I want you to say this prayer. Close your eyes. Dear God, I come to you today and I thank you. Thank you that you love me and that you're hearing me right now. I believe you're real and you're listening to me right now. God, I'm a sinner. I'm so sorry for everything I've done wrong. Please forgive me. I need you to rescue me. Please give me your strength. Please give me faith to believe that you're with me and you have a greater plan for my life. Save me, God. I can't do this on my own. Strengthen me right now. I declare in the name of Jesus that I will remain here. I will never give up. And I will believe that you have a plan for me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for all of my sins. I believe you are the Savior. 
And I ask you to lead me and guide me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to know how to live. Help me to pray. Teach me to read your promises that are written in the Bible. I repent of what I know I'm doing is wrong. Help me to live a life that is not sinful. Give me strength to stop doing the things I need to stop doing. Give me the strength to start doing the things that I need to start doing. God, thank you that you love me. Help me to know the truth. Because today, until my last breath, I commit my life to you. I want your plan, not mine. I need your strength and your purpose, not mine. Mm -hmm. I give you my heart, my depression, my anxiety, and all of my pain. And I ask you, God, that you would help me one day at a time to stay here until you take me home. But I today make a commitment to you, God, to not rely on my own strength, but lean on you. In Jesus' name, I pray for every power and principality of darkness that makes me think to give up, to flee in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes. And I ask God you, Jesus. that you would help me to find the person you want me to talk to. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. We love you. Maybe you're watching this and you know someone who needs hope. We invite you to visit Champions for the Brokenhearted on our website, lifewithoutlimbs.org. Today we've talked about suicide. There are other topics that we've talked about. But today, think about, pray about who you can share today's message with because it might be a matter of life and death. Mm. we know why we are here it's to save lives and change the world with God's love and I want to tell you right now if you're a Christian and you're like what do I do what do I do go to stayhere.live for all the resources and support you need to know how to engage as a member of the Circle of Champions and how your church can grow and learn about what's to come with Life Without Limbs developments too, about how we all want to equip the churches to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're now going to switch over to our bonus questions for those of you who are part of our Circle of Champions. To find out how you can watch this bonus content, please visit the Circle of Champions at lifewithoutlimbs.org slash circle. We love you and we're praying for you. And Jacob, love you. Love you too. God bless you. Thank you. May he continue to give you wisdom, direction, provision, Amen. perfect understanding of his perfect will. May God bless your ministry. Thank you. How do you even survive on the financial aspect of your Nonprofit. If someone wants to donate to you, how do they do that? Yeah, that's just on our website. So stay here. Live. We are all actually missionaries right now. This is so urgent for us that we have decided to just go full on with this mission. But if you want to support our, our organization as a whole, our general fund, 
or our missionaries, you can find that all on our website. We do need your support. If we want to reach more people, it takes finances. So check that out on our website. And thank you in advance for anyone who chooses to support us. Jacob, we love you. God bless you and your family thank and you. all the missionaries and all those people who continue to send you to go tell them to stay here. Thank you. Everyone, thank you for watching. You've been watching Champions for the Brokenhearted, the Never Chain TV talk show. I'm your host, Nick Vujicic, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.